The US water sector looks much like a giant Rubik's cube right now. In fact, here would be some of the tiles. 63 million Americans are potentially exposed to unsafe drinking water. One third of US drinking water and wastewater operators will be eligible for retirement in the next five years. PFOA was determined in 2022 to be 100,000 times more toxic by the US EPA than they thought in 2009. There are 1.7 million water professionals in the US. 85% of water and wastewater utilities have three or fewer employees, pipes in excellent condition went from 69% in 1980 to 33% in 2020. Very poor ones went from 2% to 23%. The country features 51,000 water utilities and about 16,000 wastewater utilities. Treating PFAS would cost $370 billion. 2.2 million Americans have no access to water at all. The American Jobs Plan proposes a $111 billion investment in water infrastructure. And ESG assets will surpass $41 trillion in 2022 globally. Bingo! These styles are pretty mixed today, yet we might be at a turning point. What would it take to solve the riddle? Where can we act first? Who can help? And how? For this video series, I've left my Cushy studio to meet with 20 experts in New York. Welcome to New York! Academics, politicians, water industry CEOs, investors, best-selling authors, influencers, NGO leaders and more with a simple aim, getting the essence of the American water challenges and gathering the best solutions in order to solve this Rubik's Cube. The series starts today and it will be in five parts. So if you haven't done it yet, consider subscribing to this channel if you want to make sure you don't miss one critical leg of the journey. For today, let's answer this question. What's to rethink in water? Would you accept everything as an answer? Probably not. I would even bet you would be surprised to discover how much there is to rethink in water, especially in the US, or even that there is something to rethink at all. We have people who don't have access to clean water. We have people who don't have access to the ability to discharge wastewater. So these are the most publicized problems associated with water. Per the United Nations count, and as of 2021, that's 2.2 billion people without clean water worldwide. And 44% of the wastewater that gets discharged untreated. But that's not the end of it. From a sustainability perspective, people start talking to you about scarcity and places where people are no longer able to grow crops. All of these challenges are vivid and daunting, yet they suffer from a fatal disease. They get easily filtered out by our brains. Big numbers that are hard to grasp. I understand nothing. Challenges in places far away. Well, really, Far away? We had a few years ago Cape Town and Rio as day zero, so they got a lot of publicity. But it's not that easy for people to connect to these issues in their own life because they seem remote. Water issues also mean floods. Water issues also mean that we will have droughts in a place that is normally well stocked with water. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? It's happening much closer than you think and in many more shapes than you'd expect. Jakarta with a lot of pumping is now going to be replaced by a new city because it sank. Oh, that's interesting. It's Jakarta. It's not happening here. Well, it is happening in California. It is happening in Houston. It's happening in various places. We just don't realize that sometimes. We've taken it for granted. We've done a lot of damage, both in terms of supply and water quality, but we also have neglected to bring people into the equation. Yet the water crisis has a bigger sibling that's been relatively successful in bringing people into the equation, climate change. Could you look me in the eyes and tell me you've never heard of zero carbon or climate change? I hope not, unless you have a much better poker face than Lady Gaga herself. This conversation is truly related to environmental justice and how it's a conversation that's getting picked up when we talk about climate change. It's not getting picked up as much when we talk about water resources and access, however. The link between siblings rapidly gets apparent, though. That intersection of aging infrastructure and climate change is creating a level of unprecedented awareness around the world, but we need to move people beyond fear because fear paralyzes it causes political division and we do not need that at this point in time we need to get away from our communities and silos and think across different organizations and different businesses so would you now agree with me that there is something to rethink in water i'm sure you do and when it comes to what we have to rethink 
we start identifying patterns. We have to rethink what the problem really is with water. Yes, there are broken pipes, and yes, there are systems that don't work particularly well, but to resolve the challenges in water, it's really three-dimensional. So yes, broken pipes. The second dimension would be what I'll call broken economics, right? Or, or the inability to see the water crisis from the true economics that exist behind it. And the third is policy, public policy, or broken policy. Let's start with this broken pipe. The Environment Protection Agency regularly surveys the U.S. infrastructure, providing us with an overview of the current state of the water system, but also how it evolves over time. And it's unsettling. In 1980, 69% of the drinking water pipes were classified as excellent and 2% as very poor. In 2020, only 33% made it to excellent, while the very poor proportion had been multiplied by more than 10 to reach 23%. This is the worst! <laughs> To give you a sense of the challenge, over a quarter of Philadelphia's piping infrastructure was installed in the 19th century, and recent construction works in downtown Manhattan excavated wooden drinking water pipes from the early Arundel Alexander Hamilton times. When we look beyond the anecdote, we start realizing the size of the challenge. There's 5,000 water utilities that have been abandoned, that are not doing well in generating polluted water to 21 million Americans. What do you mean by abandoned? They ran out of money. There's 52,000 water utilities in the U.S. Many of them are little and they don't have a lot of capital and they run out of money to continue to upgrade their little water utility. According to Mora Aller, Hawei Wu and Upmanu Lol, in a 2018 study, 63 million Americans are potentially exposed to unsafe drinking water. A 2019 study by the Natural Resource Defense Council, Coming Clean and the Environmental Justice Health Alliance even removes the potentially adverb by showing how almost 45 million million people receive water from 5,634 water systems with a combined 23,040 health-based violations over just three years. That figure is picked up in Dig Deep's Closing the Gap report, co-written with the US Water Alliance. And they are adding another astonishing statistic. At Dig Deep, we're focused on the 2.2 million Americans who don't have any access to water or wastewater services at home. And I think it's not so much about rethinking, it's about thinking maybe for the first time about mm. these Americans. But wait, when the world's largest economy leaves so many citizens on the roadside, isn't it a sign of broken policy? Let's find out. The 15th June 2022, the EPA published a new drinking water health advisory for PFAS chemicals. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! What's the Everybody procedure, everyone? Calm. What's the procedure? Stay calm! Wait, 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 wait! Everybody are calm down! That publication was intentional on many levels, notably introducing advisory levels for GenX and PFBS and lowering the threshold for PFOS and PFOA. Let's focus on these last chemicals to sense the magnitude of that change. Compared to 2016, the EPA now determined PFOA to be 17,000 times more toxic. And compared to 2009, we talk of 100,000 times more toxicity. You think it was just this year that we discovered PFOS was a problem? We've known PFOS is a problem for a while now, and yet we just let it go and let it go and let it go. And that's the model we have used is that things are unregulated or so lightly regulated that they're functionally unregulated. Back in the bad old days with DuPont and 3M, EPA knew the results of a lot of the studies that were being done and did not act. But we have to play catch up. We have to do everything faster now than we would have had we addressed these issues sooner. If we zoom out from the PFAS topic, the picture that reveals is twofold. First, policies have been lagging behind for a while. And second, even when policies tend to catch up, they are still lousily enforced. We have the worst of both worlds in America. We have these 50,000 plus utilities. We have a lot of regulations and the EPA can't possibly, not possibly speak with more than a handful of utilities per day, per week, per month, per year. And so therefore, a lot of them just sort of are floating along as if they have no supervision at all. So that the regulatory regime is theoretical, not, not practical. But why would policies be so loose if water is so essential for life, economic activities and safety on all levels? Are you serious? Ugh. Well, simply because water is undervalued on all levels. We'll come back to that. So if any kind of leader starts focusing money or efforts on water, 
it will inevitably be questioned for all the wrong reasons. I've had many mayors and many world leaders tell me that they're not aware of any politician in the history of mankind that ever got elected with votes for spending money on water. Yet, many studies show that investing in water in drinking water infrastructure when that's not existing, in water risk prevention or in the reconnection of people with water streams is always profitable and sometimes even highly profitable. So why this disconnect? Probably because of broken economics. What is this misunderstanding about the economics of water? That's a great question and I think that's the single issue that creates all the other problems. And the answer to that is that most people perceive water to be free. Very few people actually understand the true value of water. I talked about many studies just a second ago. Let's just quote some here. The University of Michigan demonstrated how each dollar invested in river restoration in cities like Buffalo or Detroit yielded a $4 windfall for the overall economy. The OECD demonstrated how there's a 7 to 1 benefit to cost ratio when it comes to rolling out water and wastewater infrastructures worldwide. And Dig Deep showed how you get a $5 economic return for $1 invested in access to toilets and taps for US families. And that's just a short selection. So, Assuming most of the people in charge are much more clever than I am, what is it that they can't see in such straightforward economic benefits? The reason that that has continued is because we have a wrong pockets problem, what economists would call yeah. this wrong pockets problem. You know, the, the societal benefits don't accrue to the same folks that would necessarily make the investment to solve the problem. Let me give you an example. A community suffers from health diseases because of tap water of doubtful quality. Nothing outrageous, but still cases of diarrhea and similar symptoms. It will impact businesses around because their workers will call in sick, some others will lose time to boil water or travel around to get bottled water instead at a higher expense. School time will be lost, impacting the community's long-term prospects. Hospitals will have slightly higher occupations and so on and so on. Now, if the local water utility steps in and invests in solving the problem, the overall community will swiftly measure the benefits. Thank you! But the utility itself won't get any additional cent for that. Benefits will land in the wrong pocket. There's actually a simple symptom that underlines the entire difficulty around the economics of water. We are not charged the right amount of money for water. That's to say we're not charged enough. Indeed, utilities could overcome the wrong pocket symptom if they were allowed to charge an appropriate amount for water and at least a full cost recovery. But wait! Why should they charge more for something that is freely available almost everywhere on Earth? Good question! Maybe because we've done our semantics wrong all that time. Water companies don't charge for water. They charge for its collection, treatment, management and distribution. And unlike water, that doesn't come for free. No, that's not the only paradox we face. The average cost for bottled water is about $5 a gallon. The average cost to produce tap water through American infrastructure is slightly less than one penny per gallon. So it's a massive difference. And yet people complain about the price that they have to pay for water, yet they'll buy bottled water. At today's pace and by 2034, the world will spend more on bottled water than it does on utility water. $598 billion a year to be spent on Evian, Aquafina or Dasani. That's more than the GDP of a country like Belgium. In countries like Mexico, the inflection point where bottled water investment takes over is already crossed, while the USA is close to it. Almost there. Indeed, the United States is the largest market globally for packaged water, an overwhelming majority of it being for discretionary consumption. I think we need to rethink the value of water. Societal value, economic value, all of that. For all these reasons and more, it has been difficult to convey that water could be a profitable field. Yet, if we all agree that large conglomerates don't think twice about making a profit from bottled water, we shouldn't shy away from doing so in all infrastructure water and wastewater. The reason why that matters the most is that it opens new avenues. I think we, we need to kind of take a little step back and, and say what is it that we're trying to achieve and how can we do that with private capital. I think the private sector, when you rethink it, is really where you're going to get the most change. Because the private sector is driven by economics, is driven by market dynamics, and not driven by a political agenda. That's where things get done. Fixing broken economics by leveraging new approaches? That sounds like a good prospect. Unless we get dragged into a last major threat, conservatism. 
can't think of another industry, transportation, education, the military, publishing, I mean, you name it, where there hasn't been revolutionary changes in just the last 20 years and probably several revolutions in the last 20 years. And yet water, we tend to be doing what we were doing in terms of municipal water, we tend to be doing what we were doing 75 and 100 years ago. And in terms of agricultural water, lamentably, we're doing what we were doing uh, thousands of years ago. Sure, the water sector is conservative for a full set of good reasons. You don't want to play with your users' health, and cities like Flint have bet to know that changes that weren't thought through could have dramatic consequences. Yet, there's also that well-known saying that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. The reality is that we live in a changing world where water scarcity, aging infrastructure, intensified urbanization and all the other drivers we've been listing so far change the name of the game. So it might be time to adapt the rules as well. Should we do what we've done in the past or should we think a little laterally? Because we are evolving so quickly we can't rely upon traditional technology or traditional systems. We need to embrace the new technology we have because what that will do is allow us to be more adaptive to what we have to face in the future. Indeed, new technologies in water often aren't that new when you look at them. Crossing the chasm in this sector rather takes decades than the Mount Silicon Valley moguls have accustomed us to. And that inertia can act as a significant inhibitor for the striving of a specific segment of water actors, water entrepreneurs. The one thing that we can rethink is to cultivate more entrepreneurship within water and wastewater. We need more entrepreneurs, we need more people starting companies, and it has to be less scary to do that. For water entrepreneurs, going all in on the technology they develop and believe in can indeed be quite scary. What if, despite proof of concepts, it suffers from death by piloting? Wouldn't they be better off in adjacent segment like energy or agriculture? Worse, entrepreneurs aren't the only resource that tends to run scarce in our conservative sector. How we can begin to attract young folks to begin to look at water and rethink water, but also have careers in water as well. Our most prized natural resources are our young people. From Mississippi to Beijing, from France to California, we have to look at young folks across the world. There are about 1.7 million workers in the extended water sector in the US, but that number may soon go down. Indeed, the 53% of water workers that have high school diplomas or less may well get paid up to 50% more than the national average for similar profiles but the attractivity of the sector remains low. The 85% male, 66% white demography also rounds up with water operators that are, on average, about five years older than the national median. In 2016, when polled for Brookings report, many utilities had shared the same alarming message. They were facing up to 50% vacancies combined with a lack of public visibility that wasn't drawing for a better future. So let's conclude here the first leg of this video series. As we've seen, there's a lot to rethink in water, and it might be scary. Yet, identifying the challenges is also the first step towards solving them. As an academic institution, we want to bring the collection of those problems together, think about what are the ways by which we can solve them. And solution here means something that is technical, something that is financial, and then how is it going to be implemented and stay fixed? Not that you know somebody flies in, has a flashy thing, and then a couple of years later, there's nothing to show. It's an academic field. In in that sense because what we are studying is the diagnosis of the problems all the way through to sustainable solutions. Stay tuned, in the next chapter we'll explore solutions starting with a way to fix water's broken economics. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out and I'll see you next time.